Our presenter today is uh, Dr. Paul Meek. Uh, Paul's been working in the ecology field for over 30 years in positions throughout Australia and overseas, including three years on Christmas Island. Uh, he currently works for New South Wales Department for Primary Industries in the Vertebrate Pest Research Unit and Project Leader with the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions. Uh, Paul completed his undergraduate degree at Roseworthy in South Australia, a master's degree on the biology and ecology of foxes, free roaming dogs and cats in Jervis Bay at University of Canberra and completed his PhD at the University of New England on camera trapping. He was awarded the Chancellor's Postdoctoral Research Award for his PhD research. He holds a position as an adjunct lecturer with the University of New England, University of Sydney, and an adjunct senior fellow at the University of Queensland. Primary work roles are research and development, contributing to pest management policy that integrates new research findings into control and monitoring. His focus is on research that benefits pest management and impact monitoring and developing best practice. Areas of expertise include camera trapping, predator trapping, small mammal trapping, radio tracking, fox, wild dog and feral cat ecology, uh, Hastings River mouse and Christmas Island shrew ecology and inland rodent eradication. Uh, Paul is also a fellow of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Western Tracks is a um, stakeholder driven program that is uh, centred around Western New South Wales, um, clustered between Burke, Wenaring, White Cliffs, Wilcannia, Louth, Cobar area. Um, lots of, uh, of people are involved in, in the project. You can see the organisations, ourselves and local land services, New South Wales farmers, um, University of New England and National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, a lot of people in our team, um, some of our staff over here. The important one for me is to identify this committee here, the Western Tracks Advisory Committee, um, led by Leon Zanka, who is a farmer from um, that northern part of, um, of our study area up near uh, Wenaring, and Ben and Stuart. We have National Parks, we have Bruce Duncan from New South Wales Farmers, uh, my um, colleague Peter, Peter Fleming, local land services people and national parks people. We also had an operations group to help oversee what we actually did at the ground level. And this project was all about trying to add science and monitoring to um, existing control programs in that Western division and also trying to learn um, more about the ecology of dogs in that country so that we could therefore provide advice to uh, improve um, best practice uh, management of wild dogs and dingoes. Um, noteworthy are these two characters here, uh, two of my staff. Uh, they're the two people, uh, Lucy and Dean, who spend most of their time out west servicing cameras at the moment. So there's several aspects to this project uh, that I'll go through in a little bit more detail. So we've chosen camera trapping as the means of monitoring dog populations and as it turns out, feral cats and other species. But our primary species of interest is, um, is wild dogs and dingoes. So we're using camera traps on 60 kilometre transects spaced at two kilometres each. We have 30 of those per site. And I'll show you a little bit more about uh, how we've deployed those uh, soon. Um, this is the first time that we've actually deployed camera traps at this scale on private property. We've been very lucky to have a very good and welcoming uh, bunch of um, land managers uh, and farmers out in that country. And uh, for the first time ever, two transects, one at Wenaring and one at the Louth area across uh, private property only. And then we have two other sites um, on two national parks, Nokalichi and Paru Darling, which are New South Wales National Parks estate. Um, this project was funded um, by Western Local Land Services, New South Wales DPIE and uh, the federal government. Uh, this money has now ended. So we're, we're, we're now trying to find ways to keep this project and others going. As we said, the main target for us 
uh, with the monitoring using camera tracks with dogs, but we do also pick up lots of cats. And we're also interested in biodiversity of interest with the weather patterns we've had in recent times. We've all become water bird experts. These are our um, camera trap roads and trails, which is where we focus all of our effort on trails, um, turned into wetlands as a result of the Paru um, flooding. So just a bit of an idea of uh, the properties. You can see we're up the top there, up here. Uh, White Cliffs is out here, Tilpa and Louth. Uh, Burke is up over this side over here. So these are the four properties. This is private property here, private property here, um, sorry, national parks here and private property and national park. We've been fortunate to uh, put cameras out across a couple of different properties in this area. So we've covered some fair country. As you can see down here, there's a, a two kilometre bar. These are up 60 kilometres of transect, as I alluded to previously. Often when we put our cam camera traps um, <clears throat> um, into, into the field, we, um, we try to do it in such a way that we can service the cameras fairly um, accessibly by road. Dogs, foxes and cats all use roads. We know that's the, uh, the mechanism that they use for getting around their country. Um, so all of our cameras are actually on, on service roads, which makes it easy for us to service. We can get around these four sites. It's a day to get there from where we all are in the Armadale Coffs area. Um, and we can then service all of those sites in a sort of three, four day period. The other part of this project was to uh, trap and radio collar using GPS um, collars, uh, a population of dogs. We, we actually aimed for 30, um, but we had some, um, some pretty tough trapping conditions and uh, we were only able to, to actually collar 11 dogs, which we're um, disappointed about, but uh, that was the best that the local trappers could do at the time. But what it, the idea of it was twofold. One was to look at um, how dogs use the landscape, how they use the habitat, and then looking at um, how the control programs are implemented in relation to that um, movement behaviour. So for example, if you're doing ground baiting, obviously we always put cameras on the ground, um, sorry, we always put baits on roads, um, but with our monitoring, with our radio tracking, it's showing other landscape features that are important for us to look at. And this was one of the aspects of the project was to use the radio colouring data with um, high fixes. So we were taking 15 minute fixes to get uh, the passage and the route of the dog as well. And the second part to the radio tracking was to look at uh, trying to um, quantify how effective existing control programs, mainly baiting, were at reducing the dog population. So. Just some very general information here. We got 11 dogs in total. Um, we're only able to confirm two dogs were killed by baits. There were five other dogs that were taken out of the system, but because we didn't have information on where the baits were laid, we're unable to uh, confirm that baits were the cause of the decline of those dogs. We had one dog that was collared and then trapped a little while later, unfortunately. Um, and shot. And we still got three dogs uh, out and about roaming around the um, Paru Darling country. We've been trying to get back out for six months to um, get access to our cameras and to these collars, but um, the wet weather's pr prevented us from getting back out into that country. Um, one of the benefits of using GPS collars is the high accuracy. So where accuracy of, um, of these collars is down to below two metres. Um, so very, very accurate locational data. Um, and we were using a high fix rate so that we could actually look at how the animals moved around the landscape from one point to another. And that proved to be very um, a good decision and I'll show you why later when it comes to looking at um, one 
how dogs interact with bait lines and then secondly um, long range movements that we reported with one of our dogs. Um, we use three different methods to work out the um, area of activity of these dogs uh, or otherwise known as a home range. Unfortunately because of the nature of these dogs we didn't get um, a, you know, seasonal data so we're referring to them as activity areas because um, activity does change throughout the year as you uh, people would know. So um, these are the estimations we've used. Um, as you can see the minimum convex polygon method is probably the most commonly used one uh, and getting quite some quite some good distances um, from those animals and covering quite big country. Animals I've got out at the moment are working sort of you know 20 30 square k's uh, in the current situation. Um, one of the very useful things about radio tracking is it allows us to put spots on maps in relation to habitat, in relation to roads, in relation to water bodies and fence lines and just get a, a good feel for how the dogs are working that country. Um, and uh, depending on your background, if you're a trapper, that's um, very handy information to have. So I'll just show you a few of the animals that um, that we have uh, fixes and plotted home ranges for in, in different parts of that western rangeland. It's another female dog and you can see here that um, she didn't live very long this dog so we've got little pockets of information but not enough to generate a really good activity area. Whereas Myrtle is one of our best dogs. Uh, we've got thousands of fixes and you can see there's some very obvious areas of intense activity and then areas of peripheral use. This dog, um, female, is uh, quite an, a famous dog for us because um, the property owner recorded every single bait using feral scan that he deployed on his property uh, together with one of our colleagues, um, Bruce Duncan. And uh, we were able to overlay the activity of this dog with the known bait locations. And if you can see up the top corner here, this little pink moving caterpillar that's the dog moving around in real time in relation to where the baits are and I'll just let that run for a little bit. Each black dot is a bait. So you can see that within this area that dog encountered lots of poison baits with that ground baiting exercise. This ended up being a very powerful tool when we were talking to um, property managers uh, in our project and demonstrating the value of putting a little bit more effort into recording exactly where baits go and also having researchers doing camera monitoring and radio tracking at the same time. And uh, I think it's a, a great uh, video clip to, um, to emphasize the importance of, of trying to record information as we're doing these programs so we can quantify our success. Now a really interesting dog for us was um, Logan which was uh, trapped over in the same area so up in this top right hand corner here is the Peary Lakes area. Uh, White Cliffs is just over here somewhere. This dog was overlapping uh, its activity with um, a couple of the other dogs that I've just shown you. And then one day decided it was going to go for a hike. And we followed this dog constantly working its way through the landscape. Um, it's a little bit difficult for me to show you without going live onto the website. But um, this dog uh, traveled in the space of uh, a month or so over 600 k's, um, going through private properties, hitting fences and getting caught up on fences and then moving getting caught up on fences and moving, getting caught up on fences, uh, going through Moot Whingy National Park and then finally working its way up to the South Australian border until it got caught by the extension of the old and new dingo fence. So this green marker here is um, the old and the new dingo fence. And so this dog got caught up in that corner and stayed in here for quite some time until um, uh, the property owner from uh, from the 
farm up in this top corner, decided to go out and bait, having seen footprints down in this bottom corner here on his fence line. So this is his fence line here. Um, these, as you can see, are bait lines from the 16th of June, 17th of June, and the 22nd of June. Um, and it wasn't, these baits were deployed for about a month before Logan actually encountered a bait. And we think based on this green line here, this is where uh, Logan actually encountered baits. And it was a shame that Dean uh, from Mully can't uh, be online because I was hoping to show him this map, which I, I will do some other time. But interestingly, this dog just kept working the fence line, but wasn't really spending too much time on the track. But it was just lucky that we clipped it up in this corner and the dog took a bait. Um, otherwise, uh, this dog would probably still be alive. Um, obviously a researcher's nightmare that he found the, um, the dingo fence because it would have been lovely to see him turn up in the Flinders Ranges or somewhere like that. There's an incredible amount of movement. We do get these very long uh, movements. We've had uh, dogs do a lot longer distances than that in New South Wales and Queensland, but this is a particularly interesting one, particularly since it got caught on the dog fence. So some of the <clears throat> some of the obstacles that we faced in in this project, uh, the most problematic one was we just couldn't get enough dogs caught out in that country. We had collars for thirty, ended up with eleven. Two of those, the data was so poor that there's very little information we can extract from it. Um, but we are doing our best. Um, we're hoping to collar more dogs up in that country over the next few years. Um, we did have some uh, deliberate baiting of dogs after a presentation, which was a bit unfortunate by a couple of um, property owners uh, who went out and tried to target um, some dogs when we told them that we had, had the animals were occupying part of their country, which is an agreement that, that we make. Um, and most of the agreements we make um, are that, you know, if dogs are causing an impact, well then, you know, you've got to go about core business. We don't ask people not to uh, bait dogs, but these were deliberately targeted, which is a bit unfortunate. So it cut down our baiting, our, our radio tracking data a little bit. Flooding was our biggest issue. Um, we've just been kept out of that country, uh, which is great for local cockies, but not good for, for us in collecting enough information to feed back to them. And one of the big downsides for us, this character over here on the left, Bruce Duncan, the wild dog facilitator, his project um, funding ended, which was a bit of a shame because he was instrumental in, in uh, facilitating this project. So where do we go from here? We've still got three collars that we've got to um, collect when the uh, floodwaters drop. We've got a lot more analysis to do on the dog activity to look at correlations between their points, their movement, fences, creek lines, just to see whether we can tease out anything else um, about the nuances and the small you know, minutia movement of, of dogs in that landscape. So we can feed that back to uh, property managers for improving their trapping and, and uh, baiting. Um, we've collated uh, probably the best control data ever collected in Western New South Wales. We've got a, uh, a collection of all the ground baiting and aerial baiting and some of the trapping data from 2017 through to the current day. So we're, we're at the moment mapping that information on uh, GIS so that we can actually look at the intensity of effort, control effort to um, control dogs in right across the study side of that Western area. Um, we've got a little trial going on at the moment using uh, quick capture, which is very similar to feral dog scan. And it enables um, private property owners to record every location that they put ground bait down on their property and then uh, that information be transferred back to us. So we still have three dogs out and we're hoping that um, with this information we'll be able to look at what happens to them over time in relation to where the baits were on the ground. And we're still continuing with our uh, DNA analysis of the dogs out in that country. We're expecting that'll be completed by the end of this year and we'll have a really good picture on um, the genetic integrity of those dogs and also looking at the relationship uh, and the familial relationships between dogs out in that country, just how far um, 
are uh, is that genetic uh, material being transferred across the population of dogs across the state, and that's both states. Um, an extension side of our project uh, is facilitated by local land services. We have a, a website. If you just type in Western Tracks Collaring Project, um, that site is a location where we provide information back to stakeholders and uh, update it with um, information to some of the people that contributed financially to the project to give them a little bit more in return for their uh, very generous contribution in buying some of the collars. Um, the future is looking very bleak for us, a um, bit of a crystal ball job. We had hoped that we would get um, funding through the Centre for Invasive Species again for it continuing this project and also extending it to the Colgoa Floodplain National Park in northern New South Wales on the Queensland border so that we could look at um, changes to the extension of the dingo fence and see how that affected dogs, cats and biodiversity, but we've been unsuccessful so far in obtaining that funding and uh, we're in uh, working with uh, the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions at the moment to try and see whether there's ways around uh, getting some funding so that we can continue this very important work. It's a very frustrating situation out there where um, the majority of the land managers, property owners, the cockies, um, want us in this landscape continuing to work on this project, um, but we just can't find the funding to do it. So uh, that's a, a bit of a barrier. Um, so that's the, uh, the end of the Western Tracks presentation. One I was interested in there earlier in the first part, I think the dog was called Myrtle, where it went backwards and forwards over bait stations. So I'm presuming it took none of those bait stations? Yeah, um, it's one of the one of the difficult things for us to do in such a remote part, as you know, being in a remote part of the country, is ideally the moment that that dog dies, I get an alert. So if it stays stationary for 24 hours, a message comes to me saying, um, you've got a mortality and here's the exact location. And then we need to go out and pick that dog up and gut it and take out what's in its stomach. Unfortunately, out in yeah. that area, that's, as you know, um, 24 hours and the dog's blown. So we, we, I can't uh, really answer that one very well, Mark. But what I would say is um, the dog I think you're referring to is Vivi, which was the little caterp purple caterpillar walking over those black dots. Um, it would have, I'm assume, take several baits. And I, th I think the same with Logan when it went into South Australia it would have taken several baits. But because we don't know exactly where the baits were at Mullaningany, we, uh, we, we can't really tell. Yeah. So we're, I'm doing bait runs now as we speak at present, but I've, I've gone from your normal active dried meat baits not being used in the CPs. And I've probably oh, done yeah. them on my six week, on my six week now, and I've probably got two that I can guarantee of wild dogs taken. The rest mm -hmm. may be foxes, but with that CP, we know it's gone straight into his mouth and it should be nearly a 99.9% .9 kill. But the bait, the other baits, um, they sort of say, yeah, well, do a big dog won't take it, the old dog won't. Maybe you might get a young pup. So no one sort of knows. That's a, um, the dog walks past it. Are they taking them? Aren't they taking them? We go around tomorrow and it's been taken, like 10 are taken. But, n n you know, nine times out of 10, it's taken them. Mm -hmm. We, um, I mean, a lot of the work that we've done here in New South Wales with aerial baiting um, has shown that depending on the bait rate, um, the first target is foxes. So when we do an aerial baiting run, foxes go through and knock off a large part of the baits that are on the ground. Um, then the dogs come along and, and pick up the baits. Obviously, fox has got a smaller home range. Um, dogs take a lot longer to encounter a bait because they've got a bigger home range. Um, but there is no doubt that if you do the right bait rate, you will get greater than 90% knockdown in, in the population. 
um, that's why we're advocating in our part of the world that um, 40 baits per K in aerial baiting uh, programs is the way to go because it gets foxes and it also picks up the dogs as well. As for aversion, uh, Mark, I think we've, you know, we, we have the same thing with, with traps as well, don't we? You know, those some dogs that you just can't seem to get to put a, a, a foot on the, on the plate. But um, I think there's, there's um, obviously going to be some dogs that um, aren't so keen on picking up baits. Um, and it depends on the bait. I took um, dog gone baits out to um, the Cooper Basin with me and threw them at a dog in it, played, a, played with it like it was a toy, didn't even realise it was food and then went and dumped it in a Spinifex tussock. Um, <laughs> but if I did that with a dried meat bait, that would never happen. They would have gulped it down straight away. So yeah, there's all these different um, variables and individuals and their behaviours. It's all part of the, part of the challenge, I think.